I'm Gary Ma. I'm a professor of neurological sciences here at the College of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's session on gut microbiota in health and disease. Um, I know you're probably all excited about this and you've seen things about gut microbes and microbes on our skin in, in the news. And I have to tell you, this is an amazingly rapidly expanding field. And one way to get that across and to, and to see that is to look at the number of papers that have been published each year since the year 2000 on the topic of the microbiome. And it's, you can see here in the year uh, 2000, 78 papers were published with the key word being microbiome. And this year, in 2014, I've projected that 4,150 papers are being published on this topic. So this is an exponential increase in the number of papers that, are, that have been published and in the interest in this field. So one way for you to get up to date on what's going on in this field is to read the 10,000 or so papers that have been published <laughs> in the last three years or I think you've made a better decision by coming here this evening to, to listen to tonight's speakers. So our, uh, our first speaker this evening is Dr. Peter Moses, who did his uh, medical training at Case Western University and, and trained as a gastroenterologist at Dartmouth. And he's been here since the mid-90s, and a pro he's a professor of medicine. And he'll be introducing you to the topic, and he'll, he'll be saying why it's important uh, to think about this. Next, we'll have Dr. Rebecca Wilcox, who's a pathologist here at UVM and Fletcher Allen. She did her uh, medical training at Oregon Health Sciences University and did her pathology training at the University of Chicago. And she'll be talking about the microbiome in disease processes. And then finally, Jessica Crothers, who did her training here at the University of Vermont and is now a resident here, will be talking about how you approach studying this topic. And so strap yourselves in, and, and before I forget, please set your cell phones on stun before uh, Peter gets started. Thanks, Gary. Um, it, it is very unusual to have a, a, a piece of science emerge in a, a clinical scientific specialty um, like this has, and as Gary said, um, this is really uh, an exciting and emerging uh, area of interest. I bumped into someone who um, had heard Gary and I give grand rounds in Providence, Rhode Island, and he said, are, are, you, are you still into serotonin signaling? And I said, of course I am. But you know, I'm really interested in the gut microbiome. And he said, yeah, who isn't? So um, uh, with that said, oh, um, and by the way, I, I, I'm probably going to have to take a peek at my slides up here instead of on the laptop because uh, we've got a view that is so small that I, I should have brought my glasses, but I didn't. Um, but uh, the human body uh, is uh, comprised of um, uh, 10 trillion cells and over 100 trillion total cells um, are microbial. So we're really working with a 10 to 1 ratio of microbial cells to human. And if you extrapolate that um, to uh, genetics, for every human gene we have, there are 100 microbial genes. Um, that we carry with us, and um, we're really just beginning to, to learn about the influences of the microbes that are part of our lives. And um, so that's uh, what m my section of the talk will be about. Um, just uh, by way of definition, uh, we tend to use the word microbiome and, and the word microbiota interchangeably, but microbiome um, really is the aggregate of all microbial species that are on or in our body, whereas the microbiota 
deals more to the individual species um, specific to uh, the particular organism. And um, we're carrying around with us five to seven pounds of microbes, all of us, um, uh, on a daily basis. And um, the gut is the, uh, the, the major repository for, for these organisms. Um, the sphere of influence of the human micro, uh, microbiome is really just beginning to be understood. This uh, diagram here shows the diversity of the organisms in, in different parts of uh, the human body, but most of them are in the gut and the ones that we gut scientists are interested in are certainly there. Uh, this is a mutually beneficial, lifelong relationship um, until uh, very recently, we thought uh, babies were born without a microbiome at all, but uh, some of you may have noticed that there was a paper that um, was outlined in the New York Times and uh, appeared in Translational Medicine that showed that there were important microbes in the placenta, which was previously thought to be sterile. But um, for all intents and purposes, the gut is, is fairly uh, sterile uh, in uh, a newborn. It, it depends how you populate your microbiome uh, dependent on delivery mode, so whether it's a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery. And then over time, we populate our own <laughs> gut microbiome. And this has been an area of interest for gastroenterologists for a long time um, and may in part um, uh, explain some of the geographic differences in some of the diseases that we care for uh, relatively frequently. During childhood, uh, pardon me, this is a low diversity, fairly unstable situation. And then somewhere around uh, early childhood, it becomes more diverse and more stable. It has to do with environmental exposure. And then by the time we're in mid-childhood, we're carrying around a microbiome that, um, that it, it is uh, very close to what we'll have as an adult unless there's manipulation. And I think uh, Dr. Carruthers is going to cover that uh, in great detail. Um, this is also an interactive relationship. So uh, diet is important. Um, the metabolome or uh, the uh, products of the gut microbiome influence the host. In, in turn, the host influences the microbiota and the diet influences both. <coughs> Some of the functions of normal gut microbes, uh, and these really are just a few, are to synthesize and convert vitamins, uh, particularly vitamin K and vitamin B12. Resident microbes um, help fend off pathogens or, um, or bad microbes, and they do that by competing with binding sites and uh, competing for space. Uh, and in other ways, um, microbes, particularly in the gut, help to stimulate the development of normal tissues, particularly in the immune system, and they certainly stimulate the production of antibodies that are protective uh, for diseases. Um, the uh, the microbiome is not evenly distributed. And so the upper part of the GI tract, um, this is the stomach. The duodenum is the first part of the small bowel. The small bowel then is about 22 feet long and winds around in the middle of the belly and connects at the terminal ileum here where the appendix is. 
and where the small bowel meets the colon, and then the colon is sort of shaped like a question mark. Um, and most of the gut microbes um, are contained in, in the colon. That's where there's the most diversity and the most biomass. <clears throat> it's, um, it, it's hard to pick what functions um, that are impacted on uh, gut microbes to talk about. And each one of these issues uh, could certainly uh, comprise an hour-long talk in and of itself. Um, as uh, Gary alluded to, there, there's a fair amount of information, lots of data, and, um, and uh, lots published in the literature. But I just want to touch on uh, metabolic issues as well as inflammatory issues, both transient and self-limited that may impact on irritable bowel syndrome or functional GI disorders, as well as um, uh, more chronic inflammation as we see in inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And then talk about um, something that's very intriguing, and that's uh, neuropsychiatric uh, uh, functions that are in, in part impacted uh, by the gut microbiome. So we'll talk about metabolism first. Um, it, there was a, a very nice study that was done in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Newdorp is an endocrinologist. He's very interested in fecal transplant or FMT or fecal, fecal uh, uh, microbiota transplant um, and, um, and how it impacts on patients with metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> metabolic syndrome refers to the constellation of obesity, diabetes, or insulin resistance, um, and the end organ damage that's associated uh, with this syndrome. And 34% of American adults are impacted. Um, and uh, he did a study that um, uh, is interesting on a number of levels. Uh, one of the ways it's interesting is um, that nowhere in the paper does it appear how he got his subjects, whether they were paid or unpaid, but um, <laughs> it, it was not an easy protocol, um, as um, I'll try to point out to you. But he looked at these patients, and he looked at insulin sensitivity and other factors um, over a period of six weeks. So these were 18 subjects with metabolic syndrome who uh, had uh, baseline measurements of insulin sensitivity and uh, serum glucose and glucagon and uh, free fatty acids, as well as all the regulatory hormones that, that uh, impact this syndrome uh, on the first day. And on the second day, after a, a fairly extensive preparation um, that I won't go into detail about. Uh, well, I, I mean, it was really extensive. It was a lot to ask, I think. Uh, we, perhaps they were paid. Um, the, uh, the study subjects, uh, nine in each group, got uh, FMT, or fecal transplant, or fecal microbiota transplant, um, by a tube that goes through the nose, down the esophagus, out the stomach, and into the small bowel. Um, and it, it was either their own stool, or it was the stool of a lean, healthy uh, male uh, who was age-matched. Um, after six weeks, they reevaluated these patients. And uh, what they saw was that, um, that all patients had 
the same number of organisms in their gut. Um, but insulin sensitivity, which is really the hallmark of type 2 diabetes and, and uh, part of the metabolic syndrome, improved after uh, FMT with the stool of the lean, healthy uh, men of the same age. Um, the gut microbiota, the, what compromised uh, the microbes, was shifted uh, to that of uh, the, the lean donors, if you will. Um, and, um, and it was different than the baseline composition of the uh, obese uh, patients with, um, with type 2 diabetes. It was more diverse, and it was more energy efficient. So there may be some fundamental difference um, between obese patients and thin patients and um, what's this guy's name? Oh, Jonah Hill, yeah. <laughs> you know, Jonah Hill yo-yos back and forth a little bit, but uh, there's good evidence that as he does that, the composition of his microbiota uh, probably changes. That's a pretty skinny Jonah Hill. Um, there's also evidence uh, in animal models, and uh, a lot of the animal data, um, I'm sorry, the, the lights are up a little high to see these creatures down here, but this is an OB, OB mouse. So uh, this is a mouse that's genetically programmed to be obese. Um, uh, uh, they have a, a gene um, uh, that impacts on leptin. Um, and this is a wild type for a normal mouse. And, um, and the microbiota of the animals is fundamentally different. Um, they have uh, a, a change in the ratio of, uh, of from, uh, from acuities and uh, bacterioidetes. And, um, similar data have been shown in humans. So this is uh, a very elegant study from Dr. Gordon's lab. Uh, he's in Wisconsin, right, Jessica? Um, and um, he's done a, a fair amount of research, and I think probably Dr. Crothers will, will touch on his work St. again. St. Louis. St. Louis? St. Louis. Okay, he's in St. Louis. Um, he's published a lot, uh, and this is a study where 12 obese people uh, submitted to a year-long diet. Um, they were divided uh, between uh, a low-fat diet or a low-carbohydrate diet. And the individuals, it, it, the details uh, of these diagrams, which are very complex, aren't important. And again, I think Dr. Crothers will, will touch on this maybe a, a little bit. But you can see that the colors and the patterns are slightly different. This is uh, a reflection of the content of the microbiota uh, of the two groups. And they're different in the low-carbohydrate diet and the low-fat diet. At the same time, um, both groups lost weight, um, although this is the low-fat diet, and this is the low-carbohydrate diet, and the individuals on the low-fat diet uh, uh, lost uh, more weight more quickly. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, these individuals lost weight, and as they lost weight, um, the ratio of these two organisms changed so that the bacterioidetes uh, at the end of a year when patients were more lean uh, were higher 
and uh, the ratio was lower. Um, there are also some interesting animal studies. Uh, this is a study of germ-free mice. So this is a very expensive, very elegant animal model in which mice are born and kept in, in a germ-free environment. And they have no gut microbes. And, um, and you'll see this as a recurrent theme in a lot of the animal studies. And um, these germ-free mice were then given, uh, a, a, their guts were populated either by an OB-OB mouse, so a mouse that's programmed to be obese genetically, or a wild type mouse, just a, a, a normal mouse. They ate the same amount of food, they had the same amount of exercise, and um, the mice that got the stool from the OB, OB mice had different bacterial compositions and gained more weight over time than the mice um, that had uh, a fecal transplant from the mouse that looked like that. So it, it's very likely um, that the, the microbiota, the composition of the gut um, is different between lean people and obese people um, and that obese, uh, uh, obesity and, and a tendency to be lean has to do with energy extraction from the diet um, and alterations in host metabolism in, in the metabolism of the person. And this may be largely in, in part uh, programmed by uh, gut microbes. And um, it, it, it is fairly clear that it can be impacted on by probiotics, by prebiotics, and by antibiotics. And Dr. Crothers will tell you about the difference uh, in each and, and talk a little bit about that. Um, just um, a, a few words about inflammation uh, and, uh, and post-inflammation. First of all, irritable bowel syndrome, this can't be a talk about irritable bowel syndrome, but that is um, a disorder uh, referred to as a functional disorder. You can't see it on a CT scan or um, on, on a laboratory panel. Uh, it has to do with gut function, uh, disordered um, uh, function is part of it, so diarrhea and constipation uh, and pain um, are uh, usually involved. But gut microbes may also be involved, and there's a fair amount of, uh, of data to support that, uh, perhaps by alteration of bile acid content and gut microbes impact on bile acids. Too many bile acids can cause diarrhea. Um, perhaps by alterations in fermentation uh, uh, causing gas, bloating, flatus. Um, and um, there are uh, a, a large number of studies that suggest that antibiotics, probiotics, and prebiotics impact on the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. So e even though this is probably a heterogeneous disorder that's caused by more than one thing, gut microbes um, may be uh, a part of this. Also, the uh, so-called gut-brain axis may be involved, and uh, that's the interaction between the enteric nervous system in the gut and the central nervous system. Um, and um, there's lots of evidence for that. So gut microbes can impact on, on function and circuitry in the brain, um, and um, information that uh, travels through the vagus nerve 
and uh, the immune system, particularly the mucosal immune system in the gut. Um, and that can affect uh, fat storage and energy balance. It can affect barrier function. It can affect uh, the inflammatory state of the gut. Um, it can affect uh, perhaps stress activity and behavior. And, um, and those are the components of, uh, of functional GI disorders. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at gut microbes in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This is one that was uh, published in Nature. Um, and uh, you can see uh, these are healthy individuals. These are individuals with ulcerative colitis. These are individuals with Crohn's disease, and their position on this plot has to do with the composition of their uh, gut microbiota, and, um, and they are fundamentally different. <clears throat> uh, so a few words about behavioral disorders. Uh, first of all, um, uh, behavioral disorders have been linked uh, to uh, both inflammatory status um, and, and the observation of behavioral disorders. And so um, germ-free mice tend to, uh, to show uh, less um, anxiety-related behavior in a mouse sort of way having to do with <laughs> their activity in mazes and um, in light and dark chambers um, when the inflammatory status is low. Um, but as the inflammatory status increases and we see more gut inflammation, we also see more anxiety-like behaviors in, in both animal models and in humans. Um, this is a, a, a very interesting study in which germ-free mice uh, of a uh, particularly nervous strain um, uh, were um, uh, observed um, in both um, an elevated maze and in a light dark chamber. Those are pretty standard ways of assessing uh, anxiety-related behavior. Uh, in animals, and the germ-free mice exhibited fewer anxiety-related behaviors. If you reintroduced uh, gut microbes to this particularly nervous strain of mice, um, and you did it uh, early enough, um, they uh, began to exhibit their typical traits. Uh, so they looked nervous. They changed their behavior in the maze and the light dark chamber. Although if you waited for 10 weeks, which is uh, uh, well past adolescence and into adulthood for a mouse, um, then it looked like that opportunity to get the mouse to revert back to the behavior you would expect from that genetically programmed mouse. Um, didn't occur. And the hypothesis is that adolescence and mice, anyway, uh, is a critical period where the, grain, uh, the, the uh, gut brain axis influences anxiety like uh, behavior. So, to summarize my section of, of this talk, uh, First of all, uh, the microbes in your gut may affect the size of your belly. Um, and we talked about the, uh, the metabolic data uh, very briefly. Microbial manipulation uh, may impact neuropsychiatric disorders, including anxiety, depression, and emotion. Um, it, it seems pretty clear that the more abundant your microbiota is and the more diverse it is, and diversity seems to be more important, uh, the better off you are. Uh, and the lack of microbial diversity has been linked to a number of disorders, including uh, allergy, um, 
irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and, and other diseases. So uh, this says if uh, microbial supremacy is wrong, I don't want to be right. Um, so uh, Dr. Wilcox um, will uh, talk to us about um, when uh, bad bugs get the upper hand. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, welcome. My name is Rebecca, and as Dr. Ma told you, I'm a, a GI pathologist. So what is a GI pathologist? Um, I'm sure when I say pathology to you, that brings up many different images. You may be thinking this. Um, I think because of a lot of the TV shows, you may be thinking forensic pathology. Or I like, when I think forensic pathology, I like to think of the original forensic pathologist from my childhood. <laughs> right? Remember Quincy? Yes. I miss Jack Klugman. Uh, look at him solving crimes one crotochrome at a time. It's <laughs> real advanced medicine there. Um, but what GI pathology really is, what we do, um, uh, there's a lot of different types of pathologists. But the type of pathology that I do is I mostly deal with live patients. I don't see the patients at all. What I see is the tissue from the patient. So we make diagnosis based on little pieces of tissue and sometimes big pieces of tissue, depending on whether it's coming from an endoscopist or um, from a surgeon. So the endoscopists that see the patients, um, like uh, um, uh, Dr. Moses, and this is, this is colleagues here, they know the patients, they see the patients, they do the endoscopy, they see something they're, they're worried about, they send that piece of tissue to us, the GI pathologist, and we look under the microscope and we work with the clinicians on a daily basis, helping them make the diagnosis. So um, you may ask yourself, well, why would you put this GI pathologist, this yeoman, uh, in the middle of these two brilliant minds? And uh, I think the answer is the very nature of what we do. We look at hundreds of pieces of GI tissue um, every single day, and up to 50 different patients a day. Um, different patients' tissues a day. And so what that allows me is that privilege of seeing that much tissue in that many patients is you develop patterns. I can see patterns of what are the infectious diseases of the GI tract that affect our populations. Which ones are going up? Which ones are going down? Which ones are affecting quality of life? Now, how do I know about quality of life? <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't see the patient. But I see those biopsies come back. Maybe the, I know when the patient comes back a week later, or two weeks later, or three months later. I know when they go to surgery. I know when, unfortunately, they go to the autopsy suite. So I see quality of life, and I see the effect of these diseases in a different way, but I definitely see patterns. So I'm also going to rely on the CDC to help me with not just patterns, which I think is important, but real numbers. The CDC will give me real numbers, will give you real numbers of what we're dealing with. Um, and also will broaden it, just, not just what we see here at Fletcher Allen, but on a national level. I'm going to focus on two um, GI diseases, uh, two specific diseases that are uh, infectious diseases of the GI tract, where the bacteria is the pathogen. And I'm going to pick one from the upper GI tract, something that affects the stomach, and I'm going to pick one from the lower GI tract, something that affects the colon, what we call colitis. I'll get into both of these, but I just want to preface it by showing you the, um, the effect on these diseases. So Helicobacter pylori, and I'm going to be calling it H. pylori, um, and when it's related to peptic ulcer disease, when it causes ulcers in the stomach, it leads to 6,500 deaths per year. This is in the United States. And the annual health care cost is about $6 billion. Okay? And that breaks down to what is the hospital cost, physician office visits, and decreased productivity. So this is based on days lost from work. Um, I'm also going to talk to you about Clostridium difficile colitis. I'll call it C. difficile, or I often call it C. diff colitis, which is because it's easier to say. C. diff colitis causes 14,000 deaths per year. I think that number is actually probably quite higher, but um, it often doesn't get recorded as the actual cause of death. It does here in uh, Fletcher Allen because we have excellent um, medical examiners, but I think in other parts of the United States that doesn't always happen. So I think the number is actually higher than that. Um, the annual health care costs are at least $1 billion 
Uh, and again, this number I think is low. Why? Because this data from the CDC is based on um, cost of patients in the hospital. And what we know is that C. diff um, is really affecting not just patients in the hospital, which it does, but other outpatient sources. So things specifically nursing homes and assisted living, where C. diff colitis is a real issue. And so those numbers are probably much higher than that. Okay, so let's start with H. pylori gastritis. So H. pylori, a bacteria, it's a really good looking bug. It's a, it's a spiral shape. Um, it colonizes the stomach in about 50% of humans. Now that's a big number. So when I say 50% of humans, it's really 50% of humans in the world. And that number really varies depending where you ask. So here in Vermont, the number is actually pretty low. And I don't know the exact number, but it, the range is probably about 5 to 10% of Vermonters are colonized with H. pylori. That's a pretty small number. Now, you heard from Dr. Ma that I did my residency at uh, University of Chicago, which was in Southside Chicago. Um, it was in Obama's neighborhood. Um, it's very tight there. Real estate is, there is no real estate. Everybody lives in apartments all on top of each other. So close quarters. There, the percentage of H. pylori was 20% of the population, so much higher. So it tends, it tends to be in more crowded areas, have higher uh, numbers. So the, it really varies depending on where you are. Most people actually uh, get H. pylori, they contract as a child, uh, again, from close quarters. They'll live with chronic infection, and it's usually asymptomatic. They probably don't even know they have it. But 10 for, to 15% of infected individuals will develop peptic ulcer disease. We'll talk about that a little bit. An ulcer, they'll develop ulcers in their stomach uh, or in their duodenum, and those can be, have serious consequences, including um, bleeding to death. Um, the bacteria, interestingly, is also associated with cancer. If you were infected with H. pylori, you are at increased risk for gastric cancer and a lymphoma, a specific lymphoma we call malt lymphoma. Okay, so let's see what it looks like under the microscope, because that's what I do for a living. I'll give you a little peek at what it looks like. This is what a normal stomach biopsy looks like. So if a patient came and saw Dr. Moses, and he did an endoscopy, he'd stick a tube down, and he would take a biopsy right here in the stomach. And he, this is what it looks like normally. Now we have a saying, uh, form fits function. And the form, what you see here, the morphology of this is very much about the function of what is going on in the stomach there. The business end of the stomach, you know, where it makes the acid, where it churns the food up, occurs right here. But at this end, what we call the antrum, which is where this biopsy is taken, it's all about making mucin. That's what this fluffy white stuff is. It's mucin. It's getting the acidity actually down so that when it leaves here, it doesn't burn the rest of the GI tract, that the acidity goes down. That's the job of all this mucin. It also is a protective layer. This mucin on the top is very, very important for protecting the layer. You don't want the acid to get into the stomach itself. It should stay right here. This is the lumen. So this is where all the stomach content is. So now let's compare that to a patient who has H. pylori gastritis. In other words, they have H. pylori, and probably quite frankly, if it looks like this, They've had it for years and years. So maybe an adult patient who actually got H. pylori as a child. So this is a stomach biopsy with H. pylori gastritis, and compare the difference. Very dark, right? You lose that beautiful mucin layer. That protection is no longer there. It's full of inflammatory cells. It's a very destructive process. Oh, let me back up with one more. So the beauty of a microscope is we start at a kind of an eagle's view. You, you see at a low power view. That's what I'm seeing here. But we have the ability to get higher and higher power. So if I focus right in this area and go to a higher power, it would look like this. And what you notice hiding in that mucin layer are those little bugs. This is the H. pylori. This is a special stain that highlights it. I like it because you can see the morphology. You can kind of get a sense of that corkscrew appearance. So that's where it hides, and it loves to live there. It thrives in that mucin, and it's a perfect home for it. It's perfect for the H. pylori, not so perfect for the person who's carrying it around. So going back to this uh, picture of the H. pylori gastritis, this inflammation, this inflammation is what you want. That is an inflammatory response, and it's an immune response that your body um, does to protect itself, to ward off the H. pylori. That's a great thing. The body not only has an immune response, it actually changes the lining so to protect itself and, and hopefully 
it says to the stomach, if I protect myself, maybe the H. pylori will pack up and move onward. That's its hope. It's amazing that our body's ability to do this, that a cell can change its type to protect itself from H. pylori, but unfortunately it comes with a cost, right? Because by doing that, we change cell programming. We put the, the um, mucosa at a risk. So these patients are at risk for lymphoma and gastric cancers. They also are at risk, risk for what we talked about before, this peptic ulcer disease. So again, if you imagine, this is the mucosa layer, what we call the mucosa layer, which is really just the top layer of the stomach. So if you look at this cartoon, this mucosa layer, this is correlates to what I'm looking at right here. With all this inflammation, with all this damage, you lose that protective layer. That's completely gone here. The acid is able to come in, and it literally burns a hole, an ulcer, in the stomach. It's a very dangerous situation, especially when you think about these blood vessels that are sitting right below there. Those ulcers can actually go in to those blood vessels and then the patient can bleed quite a bit. So the good thing is these days we know that H. pylori causes the overwhelming majority of ulcers in the stomach and the small bowel. So we know what causes that. If we find that, if Dr. Moses has a patient like that, he can treat the patient with something that's pretty relatively inexpensive and easy to treat. That's great, but that wasn't always the case. Before we knew that H. pylori was the cause, these patients would be in the hospital for weeks and weeks, losing tons of uh, time off of work, trying to figure out how um, to get this ulcer to heal. They'd go home and then often be hospitalized again a year later with the same disease. This is a slide I used to show the first year medical students. Um, this book, Oh, sorry, let's go back because that's a surprise. Uh, this is The Pathologic Basis of Disease by Dr. Robbins, <clears throat> who's the original editor. This is, we kind of call it the Bible. It's, it's sort of, it's the textbook that most beginning medical students use. It is a resource book. We go back to it over and over again, and every medical student class uses it. This is in 1979, second edition. Um, today, I think we're at the eighth edition, but we still use this book. Now, I always have to remind my medical students, they think 1979 is a long time ago. Um, but as we know, it was not that long ago. So, and I remind them, a lot of your teachers that are teaching you this use this very book and read this and believed it to be the truth when they sat in the seats you guys are sitting in right now. So let's see what it says. This is what this book says about gastric ulcers. Certain personality makeups are classically referred to as ulcer types dependent, conflicted individuals, and competitive, hard-driving, obsessive-compulsive achievers. Along with success comes an ulcer, okay? The only thing missing there is the uh, overprotective mother, right? <laughs> Which I'm sure is on the next page. So that changed thanks to these guys. We, we can't see the top here, but these are Australian uh, physicians um, who were the first to describe, and they were ridiculed at the time, they thought that these, this, these ulcers were caused by a bacteria. Didn't have a name at that time, but they thought, this is uh, Dr. Warren, so he's a pathologist. He would do autopsies and he saw bacteria in the stomach. Now at the time, again, physicians and basic scientists were told the stomach is sterile. Bacteria cannot live in that acidic environment. But he knew what he saw. And Dr. Uh, Marshall was an internal medicine uh, doc, very young at the time, and uh, he was the guy who is, you know, three nights in a row up all night with all these patients that had peptic ulcers and seeing the, the, the morbidity and mortality of this. So he fought to find a way to get rid of this um, disease. So they worked together. They were laughed out of many conferences. Um, their abstracts were not accepted initially. Um, and it got to the point where to prove their point, Dr. Marshall, you may know this story. Once they were able to culture the bacteria in the stomach, they grew enough of it. He drank the bacteria. He did an endoscopy and proved that it caused gastritis in his own stomach. Okay? That's real commitment, guys. <laughs> All right? And the commitment was worth it. This is them winning the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2005. <laughs> All right, so the prize was for their recognition that it was bacteria, that was this pathogen that caused peptic ulcer disease, and also 
imagine just by giving antibiotics, you can get rid of something that puts you at risk for cancer. That's pretty amazing. The other thing I think is interesting about this is at that time, which I think hopefully I've conveyed to you, this was a paradigm shift. You know, people didn't want to believe that a bug is bad, the bug is what caused this disease. But now, interestingly, here we are again in a new paradigm shift, right? Now the next generation, Dr. Crothers is going to come up here soon and tell you that it may not just be that a bug is bad, that it may actually be more about uh, it's not you're bad, I'm good. It's maybe how we get along. What is our relationship? You know, is there too much of me, not enough of you? So we're in the middle of a new paradigm shift, which I think leads quite nicely to uh, C. difficile colitis, or I'm going to call it C. Diff, C. diff colitis. Are you going to take questions Yes, absolutely. Love time. Um, so the um, other name for C. diff colitis is antibiotic-associated colitis, and that's important because it's very much a part of the disease process, which we'll get into. So this is a disease that affects the colon. So we're no longer talking about the stomach. We're in the lower GI tract and the colon. It's among the most common, if not the most common, healthcare-associated infection. And it's a significant cause of morbidity and mortality among elderly hospitalized patients. But we're seeing it also in healthy and even pediatric patients as well. These numbers are important. 20% uh, of hospitalized adults are C. diff carriers in long-term care, facili long care facilities or nursing homes assisted living, um, the carriage rate can approach 50%. What do I mean by carrier rate? Let's talk a little bit about that, make sure we got that. It turns out um, in 20% of hospitalized patients, um, and in many patients in general, in the general population, have C. diff as part of their normal flora. So just based on what I do for a living, I've never been tested, but there's a pretty good chance I probably have C. diff in my um, gut, in my colon. So why don't I have disease? Well, let's go back to, you remember Dr. Moses talked about the, the microbiota that we carry around. And the majority of it really is in the colon, right? That's the huge amount of the bacteria. So let's say I do have C. diff. It's pretty likely. This is what my um, gut would look like. These are. Uh, intestinal cells, each one of these things look like good and plenties, but they're not, um, are just, they're, they're colorized. They don't really look like this, but they're colorized. This is actually an art. Someone uh, publishes these. Um, but it, these are real bacteria. These are SMF, SE, SEMs. They're high-powered views of this bacteria. Uh, and a few of these, you know, maybe the hot pink ones, are the C. diff. But the rest of the community keeps that C. diff in check. So they all get along. Now, let's say I have an upper respiratory infection. I don't feel well, I go to my physician and they put me on antibiotics. Now when I take those antibiotics, remember that's a systemic thing. I take that, it's gonna go everywhere. Right? It's not like it just goes straight to my lungs, fixes the infection there, doesn't do anything else. It's gonna affect all the bacteria in my body. So what's gonna happen is some of the good bacteria is gonna change, right? It's gonna go down and get killed. And the C. diff is gonna be allowed to thrive. We've changed the neighborhood. And that's what's called dysbiosis. So instead of having a symbiotic relationship, now C. diff is no longer kept in check. It's going wild. It's colonizing. It's proliferating. And as it proliferates, unfortunately, it makes a toxin. And that toxin is what comes out in the diarrhea, which is the number one symptom in patients with C. diff, a watery, proliferative diarrhea. And if, if precautions aren't taken can be easily passed from person to person or in places like nurses home, nursing homes from room to room. Okay, so again, I have to show you the microscope because that's what I do. Um, this is how patients generally present. They'll have fever, severe, usually water diarrhea, abdominal pain, almost always have a history of recent antibiotic use for reasons we just discussed. This is what it looks like under the microscope. If um, Dr. Moses was to take a biopsy of one of his patients in the colon, this is what it would look like. I always like to compare it to normal. This is a normal colon biopsy. We call them test tubes in a rack. See how they kind of look like test tubes that each one comes down in a rack? Compare that to the patient with C. diff colitis. You can barely see those test tubes. Here's one right here. But most of them are incredibly inflamed and almost look explosive, right? 
We actually call this a volcano. And that volcano is made up of pus, inflammatory cells, and dead cells. Because the toxin being produced by the C. diff, which is, which is proliferating, is killing those cells. Sometimes it gets so fear, uh, severe the patient actually has to have a resection. They have to have the colon taken out. Um, this is what it looks like. This unfortunately was a pediatric patient. Um, the, the colon, you, you won't appreciate this, but you'll just have to trust me, is very thin here. It becomes so inflamed and, uh, that it will actually thin out. These little yellow plaques um, are some calls called pseudomembranous because this is called C. diff colitis, but it's also sometimes called pseudomembranous colitis because these little pseudomembranes, these yellow plaques here, are the same thing as we're seeing under the microscope here. And it's just dead, sloughing cells. It's important to note that this is, a, this is increasing. Look at these numbers. These stopped in 2010, but they continue to increase. We're seeing more and more of C. diff colitis. Um, the other thing I want to note that is that there needs, I think, well, we're doing it here, but more education about how much it is increasing in incidence and um, in severity. So if, when Jack in the Box had an outbreak of E. coli, um, we all heard about it, right? We always hear about E. coli breakouts in the news. Um, my six-year-old came home the other day and told me, Mom, don't ever touch a turtle because you'll get salmonella. <laughs> so that's great. I'm glad they're educating them. But if you took all the um, C. diff aside, if you took all the other infectious causes of colitis, other infectious causes in the GI tract that cause death, you add up all those numbers, they still won't reach the numbers of death caused by C. difficile colitis. So it's important to remember, it's increasing in incidence, and unfortunately, it's also increasing in severity. Why? Uh, because in 2002, we also noted that there's this new hypervirulent strain of C. diff colitis called NAP1. Hypervirulent is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a newer, uh, it sounds like a superhero, but in some ways it is. It's genetically superior um, bacteria, which is harder to kill and causes more severe disease. The good news about Fletcher Allen, we have pretty, um, we have the techniques we use here to test for C. difficile are very sophisticated. So we use, we don't just look for the toxins, we actually do PCR where we look at the gene coding for the toxins. So we can not only tell if Dr. Moses sends us a, a patient, a stool sample, and asks if this patient has C. diff, we can not only tell them that they have C. diff, we can tell them if they have this hypervirulent strain. So that's a good thing. Okay, so I've told you about being a GI pathologist is great because I can tell you about patterns, um, but I can also tell you about limitations. I hate to say I'm an expert in limitations, but <laughs> you gotta understand limitations if you uh, wanna break them, right? And we certainly have limitations in our daily practice. So let me show you one example of that limitation. Um, this is a cross-section of a normal appendix. So you might ask me, why do you have a normal appendix? Well, first let me remind you, here's the appendix, right? Remember it's the little finger that sticks right off the colon there. This is the small bowel coming into the large bowel, and that's the little appendix. Um, when we cut it, we cut a cross-section, so you're seeing this is the outside of the appendix, this is the lumen, the inside. So you're just seeing it almost like you cut, and you're looking at it, the lumen. So the reason I have the normal appendix, which just came to us this week, uh, is because there was a colon cancer right here. And so when the surgeon resects the colon cancer, you get the, about a section about this big, and you get the appendix that comes with it. It's just incidental, it comes with the specimen. But we always look at it under the microscope just to make sure there's no disease process there. So let's look at it, it looks normal to me. Let's look at it a little bit higher power. So I'm looking at this area right here, and this is what a more close view looks like. And I wanna look at this, looks like a lot of maybe um, fecal matter, maybe some bacteria, so let's look at that closer. There it is, so this is what's occurring right in there, in the appendix. Um, I wish it projected a little bit better, but you get a sense of how much bacteria are in there, right? And you see all different types. There's little round ones, there's ones that are chains, there may be some that are more box-shaped. Um, there's a lot of different little dots and bugs in there. Now, this is off the screen, but my point here was showing you that if there's normal appendix, we're assuming that's normal flora. But that may not be the case. 
Um, I don't know what those bacteria are. I can't tell you that this one is E. coli and that one is C. diff. Um, there's 400 to 500 species that make up the gut microbiota. So I am very limited by telling you what kind of bacteria is here. The other thing is I have no idea if this is symbiotic, these are bacteria that get along, or this is not a symbiotic relationship at all. What if the bacteria here is um, dysbiotic? And what if it has some responsibility in the colon cancer that's occurring three centimeters down in the colon? We don't know that at this point. I don't know what this uh, at this point. Um, it's unfortunately fortunate I stand up here and show you pictures of volcanoes in horrible C. diff patients and chronic gastritis with peptic ulcer disease. Wouldn't it be great if I could make the diagnosis before it came to that? before it became fulminant disease. And so I think that's where sort of the exciting state is. Um, I think the next generation um, with research that's being done here at Fletcher Allen and other places is gonna help us with those limitations and take us to the next step. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. So what does this all mean? We've heard a lot of uh, talk about the microbiota and some pretty uh, tantalizing evidence about what it could mean uh, for the future of health and disease. And I think when you stay, take a step back and kind of look at the whole picture, what it really is doing is it's changing the way that we think about ourselves and who we are and how we interact with the world and around us and that bacteria are much more than one thing. They're not all bad and they're not all good and that there's this very old relationship between our bodies and our microbes. You know, uh, Dr. Moses mentioned that 99% of the genetic material that you walk around with every day actually isn't of you. It's the microbes that live with you and on you that make up this kind of larger identity of yourself. And when you go to medical school, one of the first things they teach you is that the immune system's job is to recognize self versus non-self. Self is good, non-self is bad, kick it out. But what we're starting to understand is that its job is probably a lot more complicated than that. And it's not just recognizing self from non-self, but it's self versus non-self and friend, and non-self and enemy to be kicked out. So, when we first started to rec recognize that there were these things that we couldn't see that were making us sick was a long time ago, but really not that long ago if you think about the whole scheme of uh, human evolution. So germ theory came about in the 1700s, and that was a huge boon for modern science to understand what was causing smallpox, the plague, and we were starting to understand this concept that there were living things that were making us sick that we couldn't actually see. And then, even a bigger boon to modern science is we figured out antibiotics. We actually figured out that we could kill these things. And interestingly, of course, we have to note that penicillin is a mold, right? So we actually figured out how to kill microbes with microbes. So we should have realized then that not all microbes were bad because we were using them to help ourselves. But nevertheless, the war on bugs began, and we started killing. So all throughout the 1900s, we figured out different ways to kill bugs. So we have antibacterial soaps and products and creams. We douse things in bleach. We heat things in autoclaves. And all of that is really good. If you go to surgery, you want to know that everything you're using is sterile. In sterile sites, you're not introducing uh, pathogenic organisms that you don't want there. And we know that still today, uh, infectious diseases, so ammonia, diarrheal illnesses, malaria, are one of the huge killers of individuals all over the world, but young kids especially. And so killing bad bugs is good, right? Like, we want to kill malaria, we want to kill tuberculosis. These are all things that we know have a pathogenic effect on our society. And so that's what we've done. And on average, uh, US kids receive about 10 to 20 rounds of antibiotics by the time they're 20 years old. So it's about an average of a round a year, or probably more like they get more when they're young and they have ear infections and then it tapers off as they get older. And while we've seen the rates, you can see in the chart on the left, of infectious diseases really plummet over the last 100 years or 50 years there, 
we've also seen the rates of autoimmune diseases increase. And I think there's some question about whether or not this is just that we're recording them more and we diagnose them more, and I think that that's a good thing to think about and to take into account, but this graph is still pretty striking. So what do they have to do with each other? So I think that what we're coming to understand is that we develop our microbiome over time, and that microbiome is actually educating our immune system. This is a picture of Harvard here to kind of illustrate the, the paradigm of education. And if you think about how we traditionally lived in our environments when you were a baby, you were passed between individuals, you had dirt on your face, you were crawling on the floor, and you were really blossoming with microbes. And that was giving your immune system a really good education and teaching it when to freak out and react and kick the bug out and when to say, that's okay, you can live with me in a symbiotic relationship. So the idea is that if we don't do this because we live in these nuclear families and very sterile, clean environments and we take a lot of antibiotics, then maybe we don't develop this healthy, mature microbiota and that leads to allergy or dysfunction of your immune system because it doesn't really know when to freak out and when not to. So we build our microbiomes over time. As we talked about, in general, you're born sterile, although there is some debate about that right now. And when you're either delivered vaginally or by cesarean section, we know that that actually alters and you have a different microbiota and that that actual change persists over time, which is really fascinating. And that breast milk actually isn't sterile, it's teeming with microbes. And it's not just skin microbes, like you might think, and it's not just mouth microbes, it's actually its own bacterial niche. And that niche changes over time. So this graph here shows the different colors or different bacterial organisms, or families, groups of organisms, and this is at maybe one week, one month, six months, nine months. And so the mom, and I don't think we totally understand this yet, but it's happened for a long time over evolution, and there's, some, there's probably some meaning and reason why it changes over time, that you're populating your baby um, in a very uh, standard way. And so then you're exposed to other things. There was a guy that did a study where he tested his microbiome every day for a year and a half, and when he got a dog, it, he actually saw a change in his own microbiome. So we know that the things you're exposed to affect it. Um, the antibiotics we just talked about. But by about the age of three, you have a relatively stable microbiome that's gonna stay with you um, throughout your life. So what that really alludes to is the critical period that Dr. Moses talks about, that maybe there's a very important time of development of this microbiome that helps your immune system develop in a way that will last throughout your lifetime. So how do we know all this? I think as part of this story, we have to talk about modern genomic technology because that's what's really enabled us to understand all of this. And to start that story, I have to tell you a little bit about ribosomal RNA. Sorry. So traditionally, in order to understand if a microbe is present, we take a specimen, we take a sterile tool, and we smear it on a plate. These are little, we call them plates. They're culture plates. They have nutritious substances that the bacteria like to grow in. If something grows, we can look at it under the microscope, we can look at its morphology, we can test it in different ways, and we can give it a name. And then when we know what it is, we can look for it in very specific ways, and that's how we do still basically all of our microbial testing in the hospital. Not all of it. So this guy, once we started to figure out that we could sequence things, like genomic information, he said, well, it's very difficult to sequence whole genomes but maybe if I just look at one little piece of a genome, I think of it kind of like a fingerprint. You can look at a fingerprint of a person and you can actually identify exactly who they are without needing to see what their entire body looks like. So he had a very good idea that he said, well, let's use this new emerging sequencing technology to just sequence this little tiny piece of DNA. And what he found by doing that was that there were tons of organisms that weren't showing up on the plate, that were in the sample. So what we started to understand was that most of the microbes that were around actually aren't culturable, meaning that you put them on that plate, but they either get outcompeted or they don't like the media that's there and they don't grow. So we were really underestimating what was present. It's almost like we were looking at the tip of the iceberg. So sequencing has come a long way since then. So Sanger sequencing, this is Frederick Sanger here, was the first 
a uh, way in which we started to characterize the genome. And it's, it was a wonderful technology. It still is used. But it's really expensive, and it takes a really long time. So now we've moved into the period of next generation sequencing, you will probably hear. And the way I think of it um, is you kind of take all the DNA and you chop it up. And then we actually use a different, different methodology than the traditional Sanger sequencing. But we can do a lot of sequencing all at the same time separately. It's almost like multitasking. And then we take all of the fragments and we put them back together. And we use computers to do that. And we can rebuild the whole picture and look at it and understand it better. So we can now sequence a human genome on the order of days instead of years. And it's a lot cheaper. So this is, I don't even know, is that like 100 million? And then as you can see, it's dropping very rapidly. And we're almost down to that $1,000 mark, um, which is a topic of conversation. And this all happens on these machines that uh, sit comfortably on your desk, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so the next thing we have to talk about is what, we, what happens when we apply this new technology to the world of the microbiome. We call it metagenomics. And I really think of this as community by genomics. It's looking at the forest for the trees. So the word meta comes from Latin terminology for beyond. So it's beyond a single genome. Instead of taking one human genome and putting it on an Illumina sequencer and having it sequence the whole thing, you're taking a huge sample with a huge host of different individuals present, and you're sequencing it all and looking at the collective population. And we found that we can look at environmental samples this way. So if you take 200 liters of seawater and, and <coughs> sequence it through gen metagenomics, there are over 5,000 different viruses that are present in that seawater. And I don't think any of us really realized that when we were swimming in the ocean 10 years ago. <laughs> And so when you start looking at the microbiome, especially within the gut, <coughs> what do we find? So I think it's really important to understand the difference between the meta-microbiome and the meta-genome. So we can either ask the question, what species are present? And we can do that by breaking apart all the genes and then rebuilding them into what we understand thus far as the species that are present. And when we do that, there's about 1,000 species. If you took this particular study that this information is coming from, they took 124 fecal samples from different people, and they sequenced all of them individually, and then they sequenced them all as a collective. And they found 1,000 species total in the whole group, 124 people, and there were about 160 species that were present in each sample. So each individual has about 160. 18 species were present in everyone. And then most of the species were present in a few people here and there. So this kind of speaks to the idea of this shared collective group with a lot of variation on the edges. The metagenome, so if you say, forget it. I don't care if it's bacteria A or B. What I care about is what genes are present in the whole group. Then you look at all the genes. There's about 3.3 million genes in the collective sample. Each individual harbors about 500,000 genes. So just to kind of give you context, the human genome is made up of 21,000 genes. So there's 21,000 genes that you walk around and you say, this is who I am. But there is 10 times more, some people say 150 times, sorry, 100 times more um, genes that you carry around that are microbial. And once again, there are some genes that are present in everyone. And then there's a lot of genes that are unique to different individuals. And some people are starting to talk about this in the context of, the second, of a second genome, which is fascinating because you only get one genome, right? You're born with it. And we are starting to understand with epigenetics that sometimes some things are turned off and turned on, and you can modify the way that your one genome is manifested. But this is a genome that you could actually change in your own lifetime. And the importance of thinking of the metagenome is that we know already in um, microbiologic sciences that sometimes bacteria live in symbiotic relationships. So potentially two microbes will live next door to each other, and one of them actually has the enzyme that the other needs to finish its metabolism. So in some ways, it's good to look at it this way because we're asking the question, as a collective second genome, what genes are present irregardless of what species they're in. So as you may have noticed, these numbers are huge. And that is a big uh, hurdle in the study of all of this. So 
We're talking about 6 billion base pairs in the human genome. Now we're talking about almost 600 billion base pairs, which is crazy. Um, and so a huge piece of why all of this information is coming about now and we're starting to understand it, I think you have to understand that um, the technology side is also progressing for the data analysis. So with cloud computing, we can do a lot more than we could when we were just using um, you know, normal desktop machines. So just as an example, using modern cloud computing bioinformatics tools, uh, you can cluster about 70 million sequences in about three hours on a standard desktop machine that would take about 20 days. And so the NIH thinks that this is a big deal, as we all do that are sitting here. So they started a project by, in 2007, a five-year project. They uh, put $170 million towards uh, figuring all of this out, supporting research in it, not only actually doing the studies, but figuring out the technology piece, the actual databases for the genomes, the software to put it all together, the assembly systems. So this is really translational work. We need everyone. It's not clinicians that are going to be doing everything on their own or scientists in the labs that are going to be doing everything on their own. We need people to interact with the patients. We need scientists and microbiologists to understand the significance of these different organisms. We need researchers, I mean, sorry, we need technicians that understand how to actually do them. And then one thing I think is really interesting is it's really, we really need infographic people. We need artists to come in and help us understand how to make sense of all of this data in a way that our brains can find it useful. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for all the research to work itself out, what can we do now with what we've learned? So can you buy a new microbiome? So you've gone through your critical period, you're now an adult, and you want to make sure that your microbiota is healthy and diverse. So we have all, I'm heard, sure, sure I have, we've heard of probiotics. So live microorganisms, which when you take them in enough quantity, infer a health benefit. Most of them that you'll see on the shelves are made up of gram-positive lactic acid producers. And some of them have a mix of bacteria. Some of them have what they are patented strains that they're growing in a lab. Some of them actually claim to um, affect certain disease states. Some of the problems with probiotics is that there's not tons of studies. While they're, well, I should say the studies that are out there aren't of great quality. They use Small populations, they'll use different disease subgroups in the IBS groups, for example. Some people will have diarrhea, others will have constipation, so it's hard to compare the studies with one another. And then they use variable endpoints in different organisms. The other big thing is that unlike Europe, <coughs> probiotics in this country are considered supplements, and so they fall under a different regulation component of the FDA. So they're not treated like drugs, they're treated like food. And they are regulated to some extent, so I shouldn't say they're not regulated at all, but they're not regulated as stringently as uh, prescription drugs are. So there are consumer groups out there that are looking at the viability and that what's on the label is actually present in the bottle, but there's some concern about that. We also know that if you take probiotics, they don't colonize your intestinal tract indefinitely, so you have to keep taking them. Or you can get your probiotics in the form of food. And this is something that humans have been doing ever since humans have been doing anything as far as we can tell. And it really is very practical because it's a way to preserve your food. If you basically pick the bacteria that start eating it up, then they're good for you, then you can eat it up later. So, and when you eat something like this, so miso is a classic example, kimchi, yogurt, you get a huge range of bacteria. So one serving of kimchi, um, they've done metagenomic analysis of it and found that there's over 200 different organisms in one serving. And just like the probiotics, they don't necessarily take up permanent residence in your gut, but what they do do is they share their genes, which is really fascinating. So there are these little things called bacteriophages, which are viruses, and they jump between different organisms and they transmit bacterial, I mean, genetic information. And so when you eat all of these bacteria, even if they're not setting up shop permanently in your gut, they're sharing their genetic information with the bacteria that live permanently in your gut. So while your meta microbiome may not change, your meta genome is changing. And this is a way for you to interact in a very quick way with a changing environment. They've actually found, just one little story, that people in Japan 
have a gene that's present in the bacteria that live in their gut that enable them to break down seaweed and derive nutrients from it in a way that people that don't live in Japan in the West don't. So they actually interact with their seaweed differently than we do, <laughs> unless you're Japanese. <laughs> so then there's the whole idea of prebiotics. So the way to think about this is it's food for your biome. So instead of actually eating a microbe, you're eating something that your microbe likes to eat. So it's selecting for mic microbial diversity and for different microbes to live there. So ingested substances selectively stimulate the proliferation and or activity of desirable bacterial bacteria. Some people talk about the Western diet as feeding the upper gut. So it's basically dissolved into sugar that's absorbed in your upper GI system and nothing is really left over by the time it gets to your colon. And this is kind of the opposite, that you're actually trying to eat things that you can't digest so that you leave something for the other guys. <laughs> so this is fiber. And fiber's added to a lot of things. It's kind of a health boon. When you see this, when it's fiber added into a food, it's usually, it's inulin, which is chicory root. That's what chicory root looks like. And they grind it up and they put it into cereal and all sorts of things. You can also get fiber in whole grains and in fruits and vegetables. So take your pick. Less cooked in general, so not cooking things all the way through. Uh, steel cut oats versus um, processed oats, raw vegetables have more insoluble fiber. So more of that substance makes it to your colon. The first prebiotic, this is also one of my favorite stories. So people started studying breast milk. And they found that over 20% of what they were, what the breast milk is composed of is this human milk oligosaccharide. And the really interesting thing that they found was that the baby didn't actually have the enzyme in its gut to break down that sugar. And so they said, what the heck? Why would the universe put this sugar in such a high quantity in the breast milk if the baby's not even getting any nutrition from it? And what they found was that there was a very specific bacteria that really liked to eat that sugar, and that the mom was basically pre-selecting to start populating the gut of the baby with this healthy bacteria. And moreover, this bacteria has little receptors, little um, proteins on its surface that look like the proteins that are on the surface of the baby's gut, and so that bad bacteria would attach to the good bacteria and get flushed through the baby's system. So the breast milk was actually not only pre-selecting for a good bacteria, but it was also helping get rid of the bad bacteria. So it turns out it was useful. So kind of looking at everything all together, you start out with this healthy lawn. This is a healthy gut ecosystem. And then maybe you have to take antibiotics because you get pneumonia and you devastate that, immune, that microbial community. And you can either let it progress over time and go through the ecosystem development of weeds and maybe it'll get back to that restored ecosystem. Or potentially we can help it along. <coughs> we can use some probiotics, we can use some prebiotics, and we can use bacteriotherapy. So what do we mean by bacteriotherapy? So this is a good time to talk about fecal transplants. The details, because I know you all want to know. <laughs> so you get a donor. You screen them for infectious diseases because we want to make sure we know that some bacteria are bad. And so we want to make sure that we don't have those present in the sample. And so we make sure they don't have hepatitis or HIV or C. diff or parasites. And then we get a fresh sample. And we usually mean that that's under six hours. And we know that that's important because a lot of the bacteria that live in the colon are anaerobic, meaning they do not like oxygen. And so as soon as it's outside of the body, they'll start dying. And so we get it here at the hospital. The recipient, potentially someone that has C. diff colitis that we're trying to restore their flora, we do a bowel prep, which is the same as if they're going to have a colonoscopy. And then we take the donor, donor stool and we mix it to a slurry consistency. And then it's infused into the recipient. And you can either do that in the study that Dr. Moses uh, pointed out by nasogastric tube, where it actually goes in down the esophagus, through the stomach, and into the small intestines. Or you can do it from below and go into the colon all the way to the terminal ileum and infuse it that way. So believe it or not, this is actually not a new idea. 
There is documentation back in the 16th century in China of people concocting yellow soups, which were fermented fecal concocted concoctions for digestive problems. And then in the 17th century, a German physician actually compiled an entire recipe of these things. <laughs> and in this country, in the 20th century, we've actually used fecal therapy to treat GI diseases in livestock and horses and cows for a long time. Vets do this all the time. But it wasn't until 1958 when this guy, Ben Eisenman, who was the chief of surgery, sorry, missing a Y, um, in Denver, published a paper in which he cured four patients of pseudomembranous colitis by fecal enema. And so people talked about it for a little while, but then it kind of fell out of favor. No one talked about it anymore. And I think a big reason for that was that the antibiotics that we were using to treat C. diff were really effective, so we didn't really need to find another treatment. But then in 2003, as Dr. Wilcox noted, there was a hypervirulent strain of C. diff that emerged, and we were having a really hard time killing it with our antibiotics, and more resistance was being bred in the communities. And so a new interest in fecal transplants emerged. And just last year, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a pretty esteemed medical journal, um, this prospective randomized control trial was published, and that's the gold standard for a med medical community. That's exactly the words that we like to see and in the right combination. So they took three patient groups, all with the C. diff colitis. They randomized them between one group that got a short course of antibiotics followed by fecal transplant, a group that just got the antibiotics, and then a group that got the antibiotics and bowel lavage, which is an important group because they're basically asking the question, is it just the cleaning out, just the lavaging of the GI system that's actually doing it and not the fecal transplant? So what they found was that they had to stop the study. And they had to stop the study because it was considered unethical to continue because the fecal transplant was so effective in curing the C. diff colitis that they couldn't not give it to the other groups. So the recurrence rate at five weeks following treatment, 62% of the antibiotic treatment alone group recurred. 54% of the ones with the bowel lavage added recurred, and only one patient in the fecal transplant group recurred after five weeks. So how does it work? We kind of talked about this, but I think the, the way I like to think about it is it's like the dueling armies. You have the good guys and the bad guys. And when you take antibiotics or things change in your environment, you come into the hospital and you're not well, then the good guys get kicked out and the bad guys move in, and that's the C. diff. And that by restoring the good guys, by taking a healthy microbial population from someone that doesn't have C. diff and bringing in the troops, they can fight back the bad guys and bring back that kind of, um, that ecosystem of balance. So uh, we're actually in the process now of getting fecal transplants started here at the hospital for recurrent C. diff patients as a treatment option. And I think I, I kind of want to end with this um, concept. So fecal transplants are a pretty uh, rough and tumble way to add <coughs> bacteria back to a disturbed uh, ecosystem. And people are really, in the future, I think, going to start doing much more targeted therapies as we start to understand these microbes better and the genes that are responsible for their action. We can develop new, more new therapy, therapeutic agents that are much more targeted. And this can be things that, you know, modulate the immune system, antimicrobial agents. I actually saw a paper recently, people looking at um, diabetic ulcers, and instead of just giving antibiotics, maybe adding an actual bacteria that would help fight off the bad microbes instead. And more importantly, potentially, is preventing disease. So maybe it's that critical time of child development of making sure that micro microbiomes um, are well developed that will actually see a decrease in autoimmune diseases or atopic diseases. So to conclude, this, this emerging knowledge is really changing the way that we think about ourselves, our health, and how we live and interact with the world around us. I think the old worldview is really that bacteria were all pathogens, and now we're starting to understand that it's more complicated. Some are pathogens. Some, however, live with us in a mutually beneficial way, and some can actually be harnessed to use as targeted therapy to help fight or prevent disease. 
We build and sustain our microbiome over time. We know that that's true through studying delivery methods and breastfeedings. Breastfeeding, we can alter it with probiotics, prebiotics, live cultured foods, and antibiotics, as we know. And we know that these alterations are, are related to disease states, and we know that these alterations can help treat and prevent different diseases. So with metagenomic technology, good studies, I think we really are starting to see the, a burgeoning new field of medicine develop. And I think you can look forward in the future to seeing a lot more information related to chronic diseases like the metabolic syndrome and diabetes and obesity, as well as autoimmune diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and allergy, and even behavioral and psychiatric diseases like depression and anxiety. Questions? <laughs> debated. 
market share. Um, so I think it's going to be like all other things that there are people in it to make money and there's people in it to understand science and to help communities and health and disease. And we're just going to have to weed out the, you know, the good from the bad. But, uh, we, no, uh, we will uh, try to repeat the questions for, oh, uh, going forward, I promise. But, uh, uh, you know, drug companies are in the business to make money and not necessarily help people, but that, that's not as negative a comment as it sounds. Um, I think as we learn more about the importance of gut microbes and how microbial therapy uh, might fit in uh, into some medical schema, you, you'll see the bigger companies get on board very quickly. Sir. Yes. Uh, this is a somewhat related uh, question. Is there any uh, scientific evidence to support this uh, suggestion that there's an association between gut problems and children with autism? And if so, is there any explanation? Uh, so the, the question is, is there any association between uh, GI disorders and, and autism? Uh, and Actually, I just saw something really recently, and it was very interesting because a woman made a very beautiful graph, and it was related to the amount of studies that were published about autism and how much was found in the scientific literature versus things that basically show that there wasn't a connection and how much those were published in lay press in the New York Times, etc. And while I don't think we totally, the autism is a thing, is a very complicated um, discussion and there's a lot of variables involved and that potentially the gut is involved with it, but I don't think that there's been any good studies that have come out linking the diet to autism. And it, I I, I have seen some literature that suggests that functional GI disorders and autism are linked, but I, I can't give you any detail, uh, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, yeah, on the end, and then we'll, we'll get you in, in the middle. So uh, how does bacteria of the gut go into other systems? Do they get absorbed somehow? or in the blood, and also what is the connection between good bacteria like in, in the intestines and cancer? Because there have been studies that show that some, there's some uh, healing that happens if you, if you have an infection. Um, so so uh, the question is, uh, uh, do gut microbes I think you're asking if they get into the bloodstream, into circulation, and if they then appear in other organs, um, and is there any connection between gut microbes and, and cancer? Um, I'm, I'm hoping my colleagues to my left will... will uh, so I'll uh, take the first one, maybe sure. you take the second one. Well, no, you guys take the whole thing. <laughs> blood is sterile, you should not have any bacteria there. That said, we also know that like when you brush your teeth, you have a transient bacteremia, meaning that, meaning that bacteria actually do get exposed in your blood, and we can find them if we test for them. And this study that we kind of alluded to earlier about the placenta is finding that there's bacteria that are present in the placenta before, while it's in utero. And the theory behind it is that when they look at the bacteria, the bacterial communities most closely resemble that of the mom's mouth. And so they actually think that the bacteria are being translocated there through the blood, which is kind of a paradigm shift also, because we, one, think of placenta as being sterile, and we think of our blood as being sterile. So I think there is some evidence, while it's probably not, I think a, a big thing is that the, the bacteria generally in your gut stay on the outside of your body, and your immune system interacts with it, but keeps it outside of what, of you. But there is some thought that if the bacterial, the uh, gut lining isn't healthy, and it's leaky, some people use that term, that there actually may be more translocation of bacteria and that stimulates the immune system and actually creates an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's two ways of thinking about that. I think translocation does happen, but not in huge amounts.
I, I'll just add to that. Uh, it, it, this is something we've known about for a long time. Uh, there is a uh, transient bacteremia in human beings with every spontaneous bowel movement. That's why when patients ask us if they should have antibiotics uh, before a colonoscopy, if they have mitral valve prolapse, we tell them no because then you would need antibiotics every time you moved your bowels. Um, it, there are bacteria that appear in the blood all the time for all different reasons. and there are a lot of defense mechanisms that, that fix that once it happens transiently. There's a big difference between bacteremia, which means bacteria in the blood, and septicemia, which means that there's a, a pathogenic or disease-related state that, that happens from that. Um, and I, I don't, does, does anybody, uh, know about cancer risk in bacteria? It's just like, oh, these other things we've talked about. There's studies out there, um, and but in my opinion, at this point, they're not ready for prime time. But they're being studied, and that's not to say in two years I'll stand up here and be showing you the wonderful data. But, it, it, you know, it, it really was very novel to, to think that, uh, that peptic ulcer disease was caused by bacteria and that the bacteria that caused peptic ulcer disease was related to a type of lymphoma and to gastric cancer, and, and that bug is very common in places in the world where gastric cancer is common. And so it, it stands to reason that that may be so, but I, I think we're, we're just not there. Please. So, uh, Yeah, um, so, uh, the, the question was about the chart that I showed that showed that the bacterial composition of healthy individuals, patients with Crohn's disease, and patients with ulcerative colitis varied. Um, and um, it, it, I, it's a very complicated question. For a long time, we've known that antibiotics can be helpful for some patients with inflammatory bowel disease. There are certain antibiotics that are used traditionally for certain problems related to both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, there was um, a theory that dated at least back to the 1950s, maybe before, that an organism that was uh, very uh, morphologically similar to tuberculosis was the cause of Crohn's disease. And that, that's never really gone away. The, the cornerstone of treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, is to blunt the immune response. Um, but people are very interested in stool transplant for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the three of us are very interested in that. Um, there just, they're just aren't a lot of factual data right now. It's a well, really good question. <laughs> Please. So the, the question is, what's the story about probiotics, <laughs> if I can paraphrase. Um, uh, uh, Jessica and I went to a three-day conference in Miami this year uh, about uh, emerging data about the gut microbiota, and, um, and the speakers were 
really uh, excellent, and at least three of them said everybody should be taking a probiotic. I, I, that's, those are not my words, uh, but um, I, I've been paying attention, and I think it, it wasn't very long ago that um, uh, probiotics were the realm of what I would call complementary medicine, um, and uh, we allopathic physicians scoffed a little bit at the notion. Um, they're not very tightly regulated. They're not all the same in composition. They're not all the same in the number of bacteria per dose. And that's very important because it's a long trip to get to where we want them to work. So. You, you know, I think I said in one of my slides, the more the better, and probably the more the better as long as we're talking about good things. Uh, that's not very scientific. Um, the, the other major issue about probiotics is that um, it, it, it really matters what probiotic you buy because um, you could have the right organisms in the right concentration, but if they're sitting in a capsule in a jar and they all have little crosses for eyes and they're dead, <laughs> then they don't do you a lick of good. Um, and um, uh, so quality control is important and I think um, there's the there's a little bit of scientific data to suggest who's got the quality control. There are a few controlled studies. They're small, as Dr. Crothers suggested, and, and you know, not earth-shaking, but um, probably most gastroenterologists, some gastroenterologists, most gastroenterologists recommend probiotics for some things, at least, and We've got our favorites. <laughs> They're probably not going to hurt you, I think, is the way to look at it. And if you want to take them, I think that they're going to be more good than bad. I'm a food person. I love food. And so I would rather eat my probiotics because I think they're tastier. And I think it's nice that you get it. We've only been putting probiotics in capsules for a relatively short period of time in human history. We've been eating kimchi for millennia. And the idea of getting 200 different microbes that are coming from your environment, I think, is very appealing on an evolutionarily biology kind of way of thinking about things. So I ferment food and eat yogurt, and I don't take any probiotics. Uh, I'm not eating kimchi. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I think, you know, in one of Dr. Crothers' slides, there were some, <laughs> some key brands. The, um, most of the studies, uh, what studies there are, have been done with VSL number three um, or Align. Uh, Align is made by Procter & Gamble with a proprietary process. There are freeze dried and um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, probably the quality control is okay. They also make Old Spice, that seems <laughs> good. Uh, uh, and uh, VSL number three is made by a small company in Florida called Sigma Tau. I do not know why they subjected their product to early clinical trials. But they have, and they have consistently, and um, and every week uh, in in our literature, in the literature that I see, um, there's something about probiotics, and usually it's VSL number three. So, you know, I I don't know. I, I I'm not trying to sell any of them, but uh, I do think that if you get um, probiotic X. At healthy living, the, the biggest problem may be that it's been on a shelf somewhere for a long time you know, without proper handling, and, and then they're not viable organisms. And they're not cheap either. So. No, none of them are cheap. Oh, gosh. Uh, okay, so uh, where are we at? I just have 
I'll go ahead and take a stance on that. Breastfeeding is like, I would choose breastfeeding every time for many reasons, be they psychologic, emotional. Actually, it's a great way to have the mom lose weight. You, get, you lose your weight a lot faster when you're breastfeeding. There's bonding that happens with the baby. I think that more than the theoretical idea of dooming your baby to your microbiome, you should breastfeed. Can I second that? Uh, madam, I'm sorry, we, uh, we forgot you. Uh, I forgot. Uh. Thank you. I want to go back to the probiotics because that's what I was going to ask you about also. But my question is because there's so many products out there and so diversified, is there a general rule? Like, do you need 32 billion in a serving? Do you need 64 billion in a serving? Do you need three strains? Do you need 12 strains? Do you need the refrigerated one? <laughs> Right, so uh, I, I, again, the question really is, what's up about probiotics? And um, I, I, don't, I don't think we know what the right number of, uh, of bacteria are. Um, uh, in terms of numbers, VSL number three has the most for what that's worth. Um, I think um, 112 and a half billion organisms per capsule for the capsules and 900 billion organisms uh, for the sachets um, that have been shown to uh, actually be beneficial in complicated cases of inflammatory bowel disease and where patients have inflammation of the terminal ileum where they've had their colon removed. Uh, both are available by prescription uh, for that purpose, although many insurance companies won't, won't pay. Um, so uh, I don't know what the answer is, but more may be better.